I think that's all the logistics. So I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker, who's Dr. Meredith Helverson from Cornell University. Um, Meredith has diverse research interests, um, but she's maybe particularly well known for uh, her work on the important role that small water bodies play in global greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and more generally as sort of a science advocate for these systems, which have often been relatively understudied. Um, she first developed uh, a lot of these ideas or began to develop them during her PhD work at Yale University, just down the road from us. Um, and uh, as part of that, that work during her PhD received uh, two of the most prestigious awards for aquatic ecologists, the Raymond Lindemann Award from uh, the American, the Association for the, St the Study of, of Ophthalmology and Oceanography, an organization whose name changed recently and I haven't caught up with it yet. Uh, and also the Frost Award from the Ecological Society of America. Uh, Meredith then went on to uh, hold a prestigious Smith Fellowship in Conservation, conservation Research uh, and a faculty position at St. Olaf College, uh, which as many of you know, is one of the premier uh, undergraduate teaching institutions in the Midwest. She just moved recently uh, down the road the other direction from us uh, to Cornell University. Um, where she's an assistant professor in the ecology and evolutionary biology department. And we're really glad to have her back in the neighborhood and uh, looking forward to seeing what she does there. So uh, I'll turn it over to Meredith. Thank you very much. And we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you for the introduction, Chris, and for inviting me to speak with you all today. I'm excited to share some of the work that I have been doing based um, focused on ponds. And I'm calling my talk Limnology Underdogs, Why Ponds Matter at Local and global scales. And to get started, I, I wanna explain why I call them limnology underdogs. This is a figure looking at the number of published studies on the y-axis over time. It's updated from John Downing's work on the importance of small water bodies published in 2010. And you can see here the number of studies with lake in the title in red versus pond in the title in blue. So perhaps unsurprising to all of us, there's a lot more work being done on lakes than on their smaller counterparts. Now, this is perhaps all the more striking when you compare it with the size distribution of lakes globally. So what you're looking at here are the number of lakes globally on the y-axis, this is a log-log scale, and the logarithmic size classes of lakes with various different studies that have been done over the last decade, estimating the number of lakes in these different size classes. And whichever, study you prefer, over 75% of these lakes are less than a hectare in size. And when you go ahead and estimate that smallest size class, the water body is less than a thousand square meters, there's anywhere between 500 million of them to 3 billion um, estimated. So the vast majority of our water bodies are small, yet they're understudied compared to their larger counterparts. And maybe that's fine. Maybe it's not a big deal that we're not studying our small systems. If ponds are just little lakes, maybe we can just scale down what we know about the bigger systems. And ponds are often viewed as just smaller versions of lakes. But there's more and more evidence, sorry about that. There's more and more evidence that pond ecosystems may function very differently than lakes do. And some of the reasons for that are things like a pond has greater surface area to volume. There's not a lot of water volume. There's more edge effect, which can increase the impact of terrestrial inputs, things like leaf litter coming in from the surrounding forest. Uh, these systems are also shallow, meaning that there's more connection between the bottom of the water column where the sediments are and the top of the water column. We call that benthic pelagic coupling. Because they're shallow, more light can penetrate a greater percentage of the water column. Ponds can also be more likely than lakes to be fishless, which leads to different biological communities, different energy flow in food webs. So for all of these reasons and, and others, there's evidence that ponds might not just be little lakes and we do need to better understand these widely abundant ecosystems. So that's where my lab has, has come in and what I've been focusing my research on is looking at pond communities and ecosystems and comparing them to their larger counterparts. And the way I think about a lot of my research is focused on terrestrial aquatic connections. We know that these ponds, as I mentioned, have a big edge effect. 
So they can receive a lot of terrestrial carbon and nutrients from the watershed that in turn affects uh, much of how the community and the ecosystem are operating. So as these terrestrial nutrients come into the water body, they join the nutrient pool that's already there. There's lots of internal recycling of these nutrients that fuel plant communities like phytoplankton. The phytoplankton can be a major source for energy flow in the food web, feeding consumers. When they die and decompose, they are broken down by microbes. Microbes can also be consumed and enter into this food web. On the other side of the picture, we have the terrestrial carbon coming in. Oftentimes that says particulate or dissolved organic carbon, POC and DOC respectively. Uh, also joining this internal, or internal pool of carbon that can be directly consumed into the food web, but also will spur microbial breakdown. So this is sort of the framework for how I'm thinking about connections between the terrestrial environment and the aquatic environment. And I've looked at how these dynamics influence a lot of the different components of how a pond and, and lakes will function, including looking at the carbon cycle, ecosystem metabolism, food web structure, community patterns, who lives in these different water bodies on the landscape, what drives them to either be in one water body or not in the other, how are, they interact, how are the different players of the community interacting with each other? Uh, I've also recently been thinking a lot about the physical properties of a water body, the size and the depth influencing mixing. Mixing is the, if whether or not a water column is kind of connected with the bottom or if it's stratified, and I'll talk more about that later, but that can influence all of the other boxes on this, on this slide. And some of my work, a lot of my work, has a conservation and management focus. And so sort of my dream projects integrate organisms and ecosystems with some sort of a relevance to conservation and management topics. Now, there's not going to be time to talk about all of these stories today. I'd be happy to answer questions about what I don't get to or talk with you um, at a later date, but I've decided to focus today's talk on carbon cycling, mixing patterns, and food web structure. And I'm going to end briefly with some thoughts on what a pond actually is. I get this question all the time and you might be saying, wait a minute, you're gonna give me a talk on ponds and then you're gonna tell me what a pond is at the end. Uh, why are you doing that? Well, in part, we don't have a good scientific definition of a pond. Everyone seemingly knows what a pond is, both scientists and regular people alike, yet we don't have a good scientific definition. And what I'm getting at is that some of these dynamics related to carbon cycling and mixing and food webs could potentially inform a scientific definition for what a pond is. So that's why I'm going to conclude with some recent efforts um, trying to define a pond. So with that, I'm going to start by telling you a story about carbon cycling in ponds. So here you can see a cross section of a pond where it's received a lot of terrestrial leaf litter from its watershed. In the, on this diagram, we're gonna assume that oxygen is available and we have heterotrophic microbes that are breaking down the leaf litter and respiring CO2. That carbon dioxide can be exchanged with the atmosphere, moving from areas of high concentration to low concentration across that water air boundary. It can also be taken up by algae. Now to simplify things greatly, when oxygen is no longer available, different groups of microbes become active. And here we're displaying the methanogenic bacteria or bacteria that are breaking down organic matter and releasing methane. Similar to CO2, the methane can be exchanged with the atmosphere or the methane can be broken down itself by methane oxidizing bacteria or methanotrophs and they will take that methane and break it down and, and release CO2. And those methane oxidizing bacteria can in turn be consumed by things like zooplankton and actually enter into the food web. So taken collectively and relating this to ponds, we predict that ponds will have high carbon emissions because of some of these key characteristics that I've already described, that ponds have a high edge effect compared to lakes, meaning that they get a lot more of these terrestrial inputs relative to their water volume because the water volume is relatively low. And because ponds are shallow, 
there is more chance for all of these gases, which build up at the bottom of the water column where the sediments are, to be exchanged up to the top of the water column and diffuse out. Um, and that's like bringing us to this idea of polymictic, this idea that ponds are mixing multiple times a year in comparison to lakes that, in New York at least, most of our lakes are dimictic. Um, mixing twice a year. So if you have more mixing, there's more chances for these gases to come up to the top of the water column and be exchanged with the atmosphere. And we've done work locally examining this and do find that ponds have high greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, what I want to focus today on is some of our global efforts. And this is the work that I'm going to start out by presenting is work done during my dissertation under the guidance of Pete Raymond, who was on my committee. And we were asking this question, do ponds that we know have high carbon emissions at local scales, do they matter for the global carbon budget? Because prior to this work, ponds were excluded from the global carbon budgets in part because we didn't know their global distribution. We still don't know their global distribution, but estimates um, we find are, are better than nothing in this case. So what we did was created a global meta-analysis of lake carbon dioxide and methane dynamics. So we compiled carbon dioxide and or methane concentrations that were directly measured from 427 lakes and ponds around the world that ranged in size from basically a glorified puddle up to uh, Lake Biwa, Japan's largest inland freshwater lake. And we binned these water bodies into logarithmic size classes. And you can see here is the figure showing the concentration of CO2 and methane across these size classes. And then we wanted to estimate the flux out of these water bodies. So the diffusive flux of CO2 and methane coming out of the water bodies, which we can do when we start with the concentrations. We multiply that by K600, which is a gas exchange rate. So you can see over here a picture of a smaller water body, a pond, a picture of a large lake, and the still water leads to low gas exchange between the air and the water versus waves, turbulence, leads to high gas exchange between the air and the water in bigger systems. So gas exchange rates are a function of lake size. And then we also need to know an estimate of surface area per these logarithmic size classes. And as I had shown before, we don't have a great estimate. We can't see these small water bodies clearly on satellite imagery. So we have an upper and a lower bound estimate for the total number of these ponds um, for their surface area. And we used a Monte Carlo approach to allow for uncertainty in both um, the concentration as well as in the total number of our small water bodies. And what we found was that our total carbon emissions from all of these lakes of different sizes was about 0.59 petagrams of carbon per year, most of which over 98% of it was coming from CO2 as opposed to diffusive methane fluxes. But we know that methane is a more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. And when we turn this into greenhouse gas warming potential, we see that methane is actually making up over a quarter of that warming potential. And the big point of this paper was to see if ponds are important or not. Can we just ignore them and not worry about it? Or should we be incorporating them into our budgets? And our finding is that the smallest ponds are comprising 9% of our lake surface area, but comprising 15% of CO2 emissions. And you can see on the, this plot, the CO2 emissions are at the same order of magnitude, same scale as the other size classes, suggesting that we should be including them in our budgets. And then for methane, they're an order of magnitude higher. So they're 41% of the diffusive methane emissions are coming from these small ponds. So ponds are having a disproportionately large role in carbon emissions. We can't just be ignoring them just because we don't know their global extent. Now this work was published now five years ago. And since then there have been many more studies finding similar patterns that these small, so for instance, these small farm ponds are punching above their weight in terms of greenhouse gas release, urban ponds, thaw ponds, uh, vernal ponds. These are some more um, 
artificial ponds in Australia, and these are some farm ponds in Canada, all showing the same thing, that we're having high carbon dioxide and methane emissions from these water bodies. So that's been really exciting. And even though that work was published five years ago, it's already been time for an update. And this is work that I've been doing with uh, Dr. Bridget Deemer at the USGS, as well as a group of other folks that have been part of this global methane project for inland waters. And I'm just gonna show the results that we're doing for the lakes and the ponds, but we've been doing work with Bridget on reservoirs. And the bigger team has looked at streams, rivers, out to coastal ecosystems and the open ocean. Um, and that's gonna be published soon in Nature Geoscience led by Judith Rosentretter. Uh, but for our work, we have a companion paper that is currently in press as well. And this is just focusing on the lakes and the ponds and the reservoirs. So one of the, the first findings is that um, that previous work that I had done was just looking at diffusive methane fluxes. We're adding in ebullition. So ebullition are bubbles that are mostly methane that are coming out of the sediments and bubbling up to the surface and being released to the atmosphere. Previous work has shown that ebullition can be anywhere from very negligible amounts of the, global, of the total methane budget for a water body to nearly 100% of the methane emitted from a water body. So we decided to only include studies that could look at both diffusive fluxes and ebullitive fluxes. So the data set is very different than the data set that I had published during my dissertation. Yet we find very similar numbers. 37% of flux, of methane flux, is coming from that smallest lake size class, which is very similar to my 41% number, which is sort of a miracle considering all of the uncertainties that come along with scaling up carbon to global scales. Now the work that, that this paper with Bridget is, do, is looking at, we're evaluating potential drivers of that methane flux that I wasn't able to get at in my previous meta-analysis. So we're looking at variables like dissolved organic carbon and nutrients that potentially could aid our upscaling, make our upscaling from local to global scales more effective um, and more, more nuanced because we know that there's a lot of complexities with these upscaled approaches. And what we found were that both for total methane flux and diffusive methane flux, we are seeing this size relationship that I had seen previously where methane flux is higher in our small water bodies compared to our large water bodies. We also see that dissolved organic carbon is a good predictor of total and diffusive fluxes. And we see that increased concentrations of dissolved organic carbon increase our methane flux. We see a slightly different story when we're looking at ebullitive fluxes. So the bubbles, ebullitive fluxes are best predicted by chlorophyll A, metrics of productivity. So total phosphorus was also related to um, the bubbling fluxes, which is suggesting that maybe moving forward, we could do upscaled approaches based off of ebullitive fluxes separately from diffusive fluxes. If we know something about the production of a system as well as the size and the GOC concentrations. Our big, one of our big findings is that there's still a lot to learn about lake methane um, emissions. And so we have some key recommendations after compiling this data set. And one of the big recommendations is that we need more sampling for our large lakes and our small ponds. And we also need these studies to report a variety of the key metrics. Um, so a lot of the studies do report surface area uh, that's something that's pretty easy to get at these days. Fewer studies reported dissolved organic carbon that we find to be a good predictor. And that's not just unique to our data set. Other researchers are also finding that DOC is not as well studied compared to things like nutrients in lakes. Um, we also need greater temporal coverage. We need to look at the shoulder seasons specifically. Most studies are taking place in the middle of the summer. And some of the work that I'm doing right now is looking at how do pond greenhouse gas emissions vary across seasons. And we're seeing some of the highest emissions in the summer. So if we're just taking summer measurements and we're extrapolating to the whole year, we might be overestimating emissions. Um, it, it depends on the greenhouse gas most likely and these different water bodies. So we need more studies that look across time. And lastly, we're really seeing that we need to measure ebullitive fluxes, those bubbles, which is really just coming 
to be kind of the norm in the last five to, to eight years or so. And what you can see here is ebullition, these bubbles as a percent of total methane flux for lakes and reservoirs. And you can see that there are many lakes that ebullition is very negligible, but you can also see both lakes and reservoirs where nearly 100% of the methane budgets coming from ebullition. So it's important to, to keep measuring that and figuring out the, the drivers of both ebullitive and diffusive flexes. And here I want to introduce some work that I'm doing through GLEON, which is the Global Lake Ecological Observatory Network. And within GLEON, Dave Richardson and I, and I know Dave works with some folks at the Cary, we are co-leading what we call ponding, pond observation and discovery in GLEON. This started a couple of years ago. It's sort of taken on legs of its own apart from GLEON as many of our data contributors are, are not um, maybe GLEON members. But one of the projects that we're doing as as ponding is looking at pond CO2 and methane emissions. So this idea that we need more measurements in our small water bodies and we need studies that are looking across larger spatial scales. So this ended up just being North America and Europe. We have about 53 ponds with 14 data collaborators looking at CO2 and methane concentrations. So it's just gonna get us at diffusive emissions. It's not gonna get us at ebullitive flux yet. Um, I have a new postdoc, Nick Ray, and I just handed him this data set. He's going to be taking the lead on this. We're already seeing some, some fun ideas related to uh, variability within a pond. So we have measurements from different parts of a pond and looking at variability within a day and across seasons and then across the spatial scales. We have plans to look at ebullition as well as seasonal fluxes using the ponding network moving forward. So with that, I'm gonna switch gears a bit and move from carbon cycling to pond mixing dynamics. And I will show you how they're related because the pond mixing dynamics can influence our carbon emissions. This is another ponding project. And it is also answering this question, why might ponds not just act like little lakes? So I mentioned this before, this idea of how often a water body mixes can inform how this ecosystem is operating. So your typical lake that's diamictic, which is very common here in New York, means that it mixes in the spring right around, I mean, maybe another month from now as the ice comes off of these water bodies, the whole lake will mix. And then over the summer, it will warm. The top layer will warm and stratify and have the cold layer on the bottom, which is what, why we like to go swimming these nice warm lakes at the top. Uh, but many of them have these cold bottoms, which can be really great for, um, oxygen availability for fish, for instance. Ponds, on the other hand, are often assumed to be well-mixed systems with similar temperatures, similar water chemistry from top to bottom. And mixing impacts water chemistry. It, it influences the ability for a water body to recycle nutrients, bring nutrients from the bottom of the water column up to the top, influences oxygen availability, cold water effusion for fish, so a lot of the dynamics of a water body can be influenced by its mixing status. And we have assumed that ponds are well mixed, yet recent research, including some of my dissertation research, suggests that ponds are not well mixed. They can stratify frequently. And we need to a better understanding of the pond mixing regimes and what causes some ponds to mix all the time and other ponds to stratify. So this has really motivated another ponding project. Again, Dave is part of this team. Um, this is also work that I was analyzing when I was at St. Olaf. Uh, Dr. Joe Royth is a statistician at St. Olaf and we worked with three undergraduates to get this project going. We have 15 data contributors who measured time series thermal profiles in ponds in North America and Europe that allows us to get at this mixing pattern. We did this, uh, we're analyzing data from the middle of the summer where stratification would be the strongest to avoid the shoulder season when we expect a lot of mixing to take place. Although that data is looking very enticing and potentially will necessitate a second manuscript. And one of the main findings is that we're, fi we're seeing ponds falling out into three different mixing regimes using a clustering analysis. What you see here is the proportion of time a pond is mixed during the day on the x-axis and the proportion of time a water body is mixed during the night on the y-axis. And the dashed line is the one-to-one -one line. 
we see that six of our 34 ponds fall out in this well-mixed, often mixed category. And again, the assumption is that all ponds are in this category. So first of all, we're seeing that that's not the case for what ponds are doing. And then most of our ponds are either rarely mixing or intermediately mixing. And all three of these regimes could have very different uh, implications for the system. So we wanted to know um, what do these systems look like in terms of, of their, we call these heat maps, where the axis is the depth of the water column with the top right here, oh, there's my map cursor, being zero down to the bottom of the water column. The cooler blue colors are cooler water temperatures. The warmer colors, the reds and the orange are warmer water temperatures. And a rarely mixed system does almost look like a miniature lake where you have stratification setting up. And by the middle of the summer, you have this nice stratified system that's not mixing with the bottom. You don't see any blue and green colors at the top. You don't see any of the red and yellow at the bottom. And then by you know, September and October, they're mixing more as the, the weather cools. The intermediately mixed sites, you do see some stratification, but you also see periodic times where, for instance, these green colors are at the top and the bottom of the water column. And often mixed sites are more of these, these banded similar colors top to bottom. You see some periodic stratification, when that happens, it mixes pretty quickly overnight. So we have three pretty different mixing regimes that we're looking at. And we wanted to predict these different clusters to try to understand what's driving a pond to be frequently mixing versus rarely mixing. And we did this with a classification tree. And we found that the first split in the tree is surface area, where ponds that are large, left greater than four hectares, are mixing often, and the mixing is related to wind. That makes sense because if you have a bigger pond, you have more fetch. That's how much kind of the length of the water body that wind can pick up and move across a water body. And the wind creates this turbulence that mixes the system. But for smaller systems, we can see that we're into our rarely in yellow or intermediately mixing systems in teal. The intermediately mixing systems tend to be shallower. They're both less than four hectares, but also less than about three quarters of a meter deep. And the mixing is related to cooling temperatures, particularly at night, as the water column cools off, it will mix oftentimes in the early hours of the morning, four, five, six a.m. Versus the sites that are a bit deeper mix rarely. Uh, mixing is also related to temperature when it does happen. It just takes a lot more cooling to, to cool off in a, the entire water column of a deeper system versus a shallower system. And you do see that it's a little bit more challenging to predict the water bodies that are between about three quarters of a meter deep and two meters deep. This in part is due to some of these teal ponds being in an open landscape, like a prairie, where they're going to have more fetch uh, and potentially mix more easily than a much deeper system. So this has been really fun work to see these different mixing regimes, uh, but on all of our collaborative calls, we like end up getting more excited about what's next because this has big implications for how different types of ponds that might be right next to each other on the landscape are going to cycle nutrients, how productive the system is going to be, it also is gonna influence oxygen availability. I have data with my oxygen sensors for some of these systems. And some ponds, when they mix, they actually get more oxygen <laughs> because the, the system's so anoxic, so low in oxygen that when it mixes and the gas exchange rate can increase between the air and the water, they actually have this, these moments of high oxygen availability. Whereas other systems, when they mix, the top of the water column, which previously had oxygen, can go anoxic because of all this anoxic water that is mixing into the, the rest of the water column. So there's, there's really exciting ideas around oxygen availability and what that means for organisms that are living in these systems. There's also interesting ideas about carbon fate of storage versus emission. Uh, we expect that these sites that are mixing more are going to be able to emit more of these greenhouse gases than systems that can process them and store them um, with less mixing events. 
And there's new evidence from that as at a Shadow Lakes conference last week. And there was um, the first study that I, I had seen kind of with some data around that idea that these infrequent mixing events lead to these big pulses of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And we're also looking into the seasonal dynamics because even the ones that are acting like little lakes that are stratified during the summer, you can see in the spring and the fall, they're not acting like little lakes. There is not just this one big turnover event. There are multiple turnover events that can even happen in August. And um, as the temperatures cool and get warmer, as we experience with spring right now, right? We have some beautiful weather in New York right now. It's gonna get colder again over the weekend. So we're looking into that. All right, so we've talked about carbon cycling and mixing patterns. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about food web structure now, because this is very linked with the framework of how I'm thinking about water bodies with carbon and nutrients, internal and external sources, and how that fuels consumers. So consumers can get their ultimate energy sources from and two sources, internal sources, which we call autochthonous, and external sources, which we call allochthonous, from the external watershed that are coming in. And for decades, forested ponds were assumed to be fueled by terrestrial resources. Um, you go out to a forested pond and you see all this leaf litter, you don't see a lot of algae. Um, our knowledge of what happens in small streams has has sort of, I think, infiltrated how we think about small ponds with the importance of leaf litter. Um, they can also, as I was mentioning, have very low oxygen levels. And so the assumption has been that they are fueled by terrestrial resources. But we do also know that algae is an important player and it's also a very high quality food resource compared to terrestrial leaves, for instance. But it's challenging to test because a lot of times we use stable isotopes to get at whether an organism is feeding on terrestrial resources or algal resources. And in ponds, you often have overlapping isotopic signatures between leaf litter and algae, which makes it very challenging, if not impossible, to distinguish where this energy is coming from, where this food is being assimilated from. So we used a stable isotope tracer using isotopically enriched sugar maple leaves to examine the extent to which algae versus leaf litter supported a forested pond food web. And this is work that I did during my dissertation. And I just wanna give you one of the main findings of that work and show you how it's um, led to some new exciting work that, it, that is currently ongoing. So what we're looking at here is the proportion of an organism's biomass derived from leaf litter versus algae. And first you can see this caddis fly. Caddis flies are awesome. If you don't know much about caddis flies, they're these cool macroinvertebrates that make cases that they then carry around. People sometimes make jewelry out of caddis fly cases. But what's neat about them is they have these, some, of, some species have this um, ability to rip up leaf litter, digest it, and then they can make some of this leaf nutrients more bioavailable to the rest of the food web. So it's not super surprising given their life history traits and their characteristics that they derive a lot of their biomass from leaves. But then we start to see this decline in the proportion of an organism's biomass coming from leaf litter. Isopods and wood frog tadpoles are about 50% leaf litter. And then everything else, uh, Nicilius, Predaceous diving beetle, spotted salamander larva, zooplankton, and chironomids are all deriving the vast majority of their biomass from algae and not from leaves, which is in contrast to this paradigm that ponds are going to, forested ponds are going to have a leaf based food web. So ponds do have a lot of terrestrial leaf litter, but they also have a lot of primary production, which is what's fueling this food web. So it's not just about the availability of terrestrial inputs, but the autochthonous, the algal resource base, that availability really matters. So this has got me thinking about possible interactions between terrestrial inputs and ecosystem metabolism uh, with the amount of organic matter that's produced within a system. And this has led to a very fun collaboration with Patrick Kelly and Rachel Hovell looking at how ponds and lakes process organic matter. And we are integrating food webs with ecosystem metabolism. 
with the same sort of framework, thinking about terrestrial carbon versus internal nutrients and what's fueling consumers. And over the last few decades, there's been a lot of exciting research around metabolism because we have these cool new oxygen sensors that you can put out in a water column and you can easily measure gross primer production and ecosystem respiration. And these are metrics of how organic matter is processed with ecosystem respiration showing a lot of breakdown of organic matter, gross primer production showing how much is actually produced in the system. But consumer allotheny, as I just talked about, the amount of terrestrial or the extent to which terrestrial resources are entering into the food web is another metric of how organic matter is processed in the system that influences things like the productivity of the food web, how much zooplankton can persist in a given water body. So there are really exciting parallels between metabolism and allotheny that we're exploring um, both through a manuscript right now that's in revision as well as a grant proposal that we're working on. And here again, we have this diagram showing how GPP, ER, and allotheny all respond to carbon and nutrients. And DOC and nutrients and chlorophyll are often used as proxies for GPP, ER, and allotheny. It's a lot easier to just go grab a sample of water and look for nutrients and dissolved organic carbon than to look for the metabolic rates or to measure allotheny with, with isotopes. Uh, but they're all responding to carbon and nutrients. However, the assumption has long been that, so that, that many of these relationships are linear. And this is some of Patrick Kelly's work published in 2018 that was recently tested with some experiments by Carly Olson, um, Chris Solomon's on that paper, looking at uh, the relationship between GPP, DOC, and nutrients. And the assumption prior to this work was that if you add more dissolved organic carbon to the system, more terrestrial carbon, it is colored and it can actually shade out production. So the idea would be that there's a linear negative relationship between GPP and DOC. And what this work has found um, and some others that are finding similar patterns in lakes are that the relationship's a lot more complex than that. And DOC and its associated nutrients can actually fertilize a lake, increase its GPP, and have this unimodal relationship. And the peak of this relationship is related to the DOC to phosphorus loads where if you have more phosphorus relative to DOC, you get a higher peak in production. If you have more DOC relative to phosphorus, you get a lower peak in that production. And the, the peak can move left to right on this DOC load uh, if you have a smaller or a bigger lake. So ponds, these smaller, they didn't particularly look at ponds specifically, but the idea would be that ponds would peak at higher DOC concentrations due to a shallower mixing depth. You can also think about ponds being shallow gets more light throughout the water column to begin with. So they might be able to tolerate more DOC and still have high production, which could explain some of my previous results where you have an algal-based food web despite high DOC, high terrestrial inputs. Um, so this idea that the, there's not a linear relationship is pretty exciting and has big implications for how we're predicting how lakes are gonna change with increased uh, browning, increased carbon and increased nutrients. But we really do need to test this idea across diverse lakes and see if it's holding. And we also think that allotheny may be responding nonlinearly in, in the same way. So what we did here was we, we created data sets of metabolism and allotheny. And unfortunately, people do not generally measure allotheny and metabolism together. So we had to create different databases. We mined the literature for gross primer production, ecosystem respiration, which is the same database of metabolism and a separate database for allotheny. And we looked at several different predictor variables that are expected to influence both metabolism and allotheny. And we wanted to look at the strength of these relationships as well as the shape of the relationships to see if they're linear or not. And what you can see here are our results for GPP based off of total phosphorus. Total phosphorus is the best predictor of GPP, but it's not exactly linear. It doesn't start, GPP doesn't start increasing 
with phosphorus until you get to lakes that have higher than about 11 micrograms per liter of phosphorus. And again, it plateaus at the top. There's also relationships with surface area. It's linear until about five kilometers squared and then plateaus. Um, some relationships with latitude and then this unimodal relationship with VOC, again, suggesting that GPP is higher when you get intermediate amounts of DOC. That DOC and its associated nutrients can maybe fertilize the system. Ecosystem respiration, um, I should mention these are boosted regression tree results. Uh, the model for ecosystem restoration was lower than the others, uh, which we found out was because of its coupling with GPP. So the best predictor of, of ER is actually GPP. You also see the similar relationship with TP. Um, we also found decoupling, particularly at high DOC concentrations where ER and GPP are coupled, but when you get a lot of DOC, you get more respiration than GPP. And then excitingly, we have a lock thinny here. And you're also seeing a lot of nonlinear relationships. DOC is the best predictor and it's noisy, right? You see this drop in a lock thinny and then the spike in a lock thinny. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about why it's noisy, but you also see a unimodal relationship with total phosphorus. Again, suggesting that a lock thinny needs some DOC, some nutrients in the system to get going. And so here I've put phosphorus and carbon together. The x-axis is the same, so you can directly compare where some of these changes are occurring. And we see that maybe carbon and nutrients are interacting to affect how organic matter is processed. And there's a lot of change happening at intermediate concentrations of phosphorus and intermediate concentrations of DOC, which are common characteristics for many of the world's lakes. So for instance, right where GPP and phosphorus begin to have this increased positive relationship, that's the point at which we have the highest allophony, which potentially makes sense because after this point, we have more production, more algal resources, and allophony is going to decline. And then we have our lowest amount of allophony right around the peak in uh, DOC and GPP. So there's some, I mean, these are different data sets too, and we're still seeing these patterns. So there's a lot of, of, of promise um, in terms of thinking about these nonlinear relationships. And we think that we need to integrate these nonlinear relationships into our paradigm. If we want to better predict how a lake is going to respond to eutrophication or browning, it's gonna depend on their starting condition and where they are on these points. We're also looking at these interactions between DOC and nutrients. So on the x-axis here, we have the ratio of DOC to total nutrients with gross primer production. And we see kind of a wedge shape here uh, where there's a lot of variability uh, to, that may partly be explained by the phosphorus concentration. And then we also see a lock thinny with this uh, unimodal relationship as well. And you can note that sort of at the, where the bottom of this curve is, is right around where the top of the allophony curve is. So when GPP is the lowest, we see the highest allophony, which makes a lot of sense. There's less algal resources, there's gonna be more allophony. Um, and both of those, uh, the lakes at that point have some of DOC and some TNTP. And so you can see some changes happening. So this is all sort of in the works and we are currently revising a grant proposal to look at allophony, GPP and ER in the same set of lakes uh, with some experimental manipulations and a modeling component to think about changes to browning and eutrophication. So with that, I'm briefly going to conclude on what is a pond, and then I'll be able to answer questions. I know some have been coming in. So let's recap what we know. Ponds are hot spots for carbon dioxide and methane. Ponds stratify commonly with intermittent mixing, depending on their area and depth. These mixing events could be hot moments for biogeochemistry to take place. Pond food webs can be algal based despite having high terrestrial inputs of carbon. And allochthony GPP and ER relate non-linearly to TP, DOC and their combination, their interactions. And it can be mediated by lake size as predicted by um, my collaborator Patrick Kelly's model. So ponds, I'm arguing, are not just little lakes. They're really interesting and unique systems that we don't have a definition for. 
So this is another Gleon Ponding collaboration where we are looking at what a pond is. What do people call a pond? What are some of the definitions that exist for ponds? What are the data look like for ponds compared to lakes? And what I'm showing you here are the results of mining definitions from a literature search on what a pond is. And surface area and small are two things that we see in a lot of the definitions. Um, but for surface area, 33 of our 54 studies mention surface area in their definition. 33 of, so 33 of those 49 studies, sorry, so 49 out of 54 mentioned surface area, 33 of those 54 actually gave a value for surface area. Then most of those definitions are saying the maximum surface area of a pond is less than 100,000 square meters. There were two studies that went up to a million square meters. I think that's probably too high. Uh, but then definitions include permanence, that they could be temporary or permanent, and then got into talking about depth. And a lot of these depth definitions were very vague, saying that ponds are shallow. Uh, the ones that do provide an actual quantitative number, there were nine and 54 studies that gave a number, and they typically are eight meters or less in depth. Um, few studies mention light and mixing, but those that do, they're starting to get more at this functional definition of what a pond is, that ponds mix more than lakes, that ponds have more light that can penetrate more of the water column. We also surveyed states to find out if they have a definition of a pond, if they use ponds in their legislation. No state had a definition of a pond, yet 50% of states that were surveyed use pond in their legislation. So there's this kind of vague, nebulous idea of, of what a pond actually is, if they're protecting ponds, but then they don't define what a pond is. Um, and then where the legislation include these water bodies, four states lump their ponds with their lakes, five states lump their ponds with wetlands, and three states include ponds as both lakes and wetlands, which gets confusing. And now we're exploring data. We have mined the literature for data on ponds and comparing that to the National Lake Assessment, the EPA National Lake Assessment that surveys the nation's lakes, as well as the EPA wetland survey surveying the nation's wetlands. And we're seeing that ponds are often intermediate in terms of things like nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, and then they're more variable in many of these characteristics like DOC. Um, so ponds can be much more variable than lakes and wetlands in terms of their characteristics. And they're oftentimes intermediate between a lake and a wetland, which is pretty intuitive. So ponds are important habitats. They do differ from lakes and wetlands. They lack protection, they lack monitoring. Uh, that can be challenging if we're thinking about the abundance of these water bodies and making sure that they're, um, tra we're tracking how they change. Definitions are vague and variable. And I wish I could give you our definition right now. We're working on it, um, trying to figure out how to synthesize all of this into our manuscript that we're working on. So stay tuned. But our goal is to kind of come up with both the data needs that we need to create a functional definition and a starting point for a definition. So I'm going to conclude by saying that I'm launching my lab here at Cornell. I arrived in August. Uh, I have inherited these experimental ponds. I think there are endless opportunities, including opportunities for collaboration. This is what the ponds look like on the ground. I've got one of my kids as my field helper here. Um, it's, it's been really fun to kind of get to know these systems just since my arrival and they're starting to, to thaw out and we're planning lots of fun experiments for this summer. So to conclude, ponds are locally and globally important ecosystems at local scales. They're interacting between the terrestrial, the aquatic interface, processing carbon and nutrients, important spots for biodiversity. And on global scales, they're really important for global biogeochemical cycling. And by taking a multi-scale approach to studying ponds, we can inform how these aquatic ecosystems are functioning and how they're responding to environmental change. With that, uh, this, my work, as I've, I've shown, is very collaborative. I have many people to thank. I'll highlight Dave Richardson, the, the ponding team, um, the global methane synthesis team, Rachel Hevel and Patrick Kelly with some of our recent work. And with that, I would be happy to answer questions.
Well, thanks, Meredith, for a great talk. Um, fun to think about ponds and lakes and where the lines are and where they aren't. Uh, we've had a bunch of questions come in. I'm going to uh, try to uh, organize them in some order that makes sense. We'll see how I do. Uh, but one of the first questions that came in uh, was from Tristan Tabor. Uh, and it has to do with the mixing regimes of ponds and uh, a question about uh, when you were thinking about whether ponds were mixed or not, how are you determining, uh, how are you defining whether they're mixed or not? So uh, the question is, I understand that the thermal stratification is occurring. Uh, however, if, if there's not a strong thermocline, then it maybe it's not a barrier to mixing. And so is there some gray area in there? Yes, that's a great question. Is thinking that has been something we've thought quite a lot about is what's our threshold for if a system is mixed or stratified. And we didn't have the, the data across all of these ponds to look at some of the, the lake uh, metrics for kind of like the, the depth of the mixed layer or the strength of the stratification. Um, so we decided to go with a, a gradient threshold. So there was work that came out um, by Emma Gray last year looking at how we have a lot of different metrics for mixing depth in lakes and different ways of measuring it based off of temperature differences or based off of density differences. And if it's just a difference between the top and the bottom or wherever you're comparing it to, or if you should um, look at it over, um, over the total depth of the system. And ultimately she recommended using density over temperature and using the gradient over just a difference. And so we are using that approach of density differences over a gradient of the entire pond depth by looking at the difference in the density gradient from the top and the bottom. And we compared a wide variety of thresholds. And then we clustered at each of those thresholds. So we went from, it was like 0.03 kilograms per meter squared per meter to 0.4 milligrams or kilograms per, per square meter per meter of those gradient thresholds. And we found pretty similar clustering across that gradient. And then we looked at how stable that was and when our pond switching clusters. And we ended up using a, a threshold, If you're, it sounds like you're familiar with this stuff of 0.287 was our, our threshold. Um, so we, we basically took Emma's um, recommendations of looking at all of these different thresholds, trying to figure out the one that works best with our data. We went through each pond and looked and plotted, and we have a shiny app that we'll be publishing to, so you can actually explore that and change the threshold and see how that, that affects our, our results. It doesn't affect our results very much, which is, is good for us. Cool. Thank you. Um, question about uh, how uh, pond greenhouse gas emissions are going to be changing into the future. Um, you know, you've talked a bunch about, about what they look like, but what do, what do people know about what they're going to look like a decade from now or 50 years from now? Yeah, there's some very interesting work coming out of long-term warming experiments in both the UK and in Denmark. And there were some of these results, um, some new results that were presented last week at the, the Shallow Lakes, the Global Shallow Lakes Conference. And it seems like there are some differences in what people are finding, uh, particularly with methane, that uh, there's ex the expectation that methane emissions are going to increase. But there is now interesting work looking at the methanogens versus the methanotropes. So the methanogens are making that methane and the methanotropes can turn that methane back into CO2. So we'd rather have emissions as CO2 than as methane um, because of its warming potential. And there's a group, the, the, I believe I'm getting this right, that the group in England are finding that the methanogens are ramping up more than the methanotrophs. So more methane is being made, but not being oxidized back into CO2. The Denmark group is actually finding that the methanotrophs are becoming more active with rising temperatures. And so maybe they can keep pace. So there's, I think, going to be a little bit of a debate around what's going to happen because we, we know that um, more methane will be produced. It's a question of if the methanotrophs can break that down kind of as fast as it's being produced. So it's, it's going to be important to look at. And then it's going to be important to take it beyond those mesocosms and see what ponds are actually doing um, because ponds generally are deeper than those mesocosms have different biogeochemistry. So it's going to be important to look at 
what I'm excited is our experimental ponds, we do have power at some of the ponds. So there might be a chance to do some actual warming experiments and see at a bigger scale what we're, what we're finding. Mm -hmm. uh, a question that came in, this may be a little bit related, uh, is asking about uh, permanence of ponds and, and drought and, and drying down and how that might be related to some of the, um, or how it might influence some of the patterns that you've talked about in your talk today. Yeah, another exciting question. Uh, we do find that temporary systems or systems that have a lot of drawdown on the edges, that during that drying period where the sediments are still pretty wet, there's a lot of emissions. And then once the sediment is completely dry, there's a lot fewer emissions. So it sort of depends on if it's like a wet dry cycle, wet dry, wet dry, wet dry, or if the sediments are saturated when for a long time before they dry out. But when sediments are saturated and there's no water, there's a lot of emissions. And there's a group called Dry Flux that is looking at this in different, different aquatic water bodies, streams, rivers, reservoirs, ponds, lakes. Uh, and they, they found um, in their first round of studies that ponds are one of the biggest uh, emitters as they're drying. So that is something that I'm curious to learn more about. I'm participating in the second round of dry flux this year where they're gonna compare if sediments that are vegetated are different than sediments that aren't vegetated because vegetation often comes up really quickly as these systems dry. Um, so that's another kind of fun global collaboration and an understudied aspect of all aquatic habitats is what's happening as they dry, which might happen more with climate change. Yeah, neat. Uh, let's see, maybe I'll try to squeeze in one more question here. And the one in front of me is uh, uh, from Zygrabowski about uh, I see. Uh, getting to uh, definitions of, of dams and definitions of ponds and how those things may or may not be linked, obviously dams and impoundments are a big environmental issue as well. And in your classification, I guess the question is, did you, did you think about those connections? Yeah, so for our classification, we are not thinking about mm -hmm. dams um, and reservoirs. We sort of kept them out of, of the system. But I guess that, that leads me to have to, so two sort of thoughts. One is like being back in the Northeast, we see these small reservoirs everywhere, right? There are small dams with a reservoir all over our landscape and, and the states are taking them out. And so what does that mean for carbon both behind, like in the current reservoir and then if we remove them? Uh, and I've been chatting with the New York DEC and they're interested in that question. Um, and that goes back to the paper with Bridget Deemer that I mentioned where I just was showing today the lake and the pond data. The reservoir data, reservoirs are more sensitive to changes in productivity than lakes are. So more nutrients, more chlorophyll, a lot more methane emissions. Yet our data set is missing our small reservoirs. We have a lot of large reservoirs in this global data set. And so now being back in New York, I'm like, we have to start looking at these small reservoirs and seeing if they have the same patterns, seeing if they have a lot higher emissions, um, seeing if the lake size relationship is holding up with reservoirs um, the same way that they do with ponds to lakes. So I have not been thinking about definitions for that, but I have been thinking about that lake size relationship with reservoirs. Great. Um, well, I'll uh, close things off here uh, so that people here on the East Coast at least can get to lunch. Uh, and thank you again, Dr. Hogerson, for a really interesting talk. Uh, we will, uh, there are some other questions that we didn't get to. And um, if you get a chance, maybe you'll be able to respond to some of those people individually later on. Uh, but uh, thank you very much and uh, welcome back to the neighborhood and hopefully we'll, we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Thanks for everyone. having me.